This is the 96 AD Podcast, Episode 5, Background 4, The End of the Republic. This episode, I will kill off the Republic by following the endless civil wars to the reign of Augustus when he first ascended to the Emperorship in 27 BC. I'll be uploading the last of the background episodes next week. This episode will be done a bit differently than the others. I plan to cover the history of 49 through 27 BC first, in the first half of the episode, then in the second half, I'll just discuss the end of the Republic, why and how it happened, and ponder the most exciting democracy in history. Last episode, I left you with Caesar, entering Italy at the head of an army. Caesar marched into Italy after coming to the realization that the Senate will ruin his life the second he enters Rome as a private citizen. Those senators, after hearing that Caesar was approaching the city, are now quaking in their boots, while also feeling somewhat smug because they've all been saying for years that Caesar wants to be a monarch and, well, here's the proof. Let's remember that last time disgruntled generals marched into the city, Marius and Sulla, they purged all of their enemies. And then when the next one marched in, there was a counter purge. By the end of it, no rich senator was left untouched. Everyone knew someone was killed. So, naturally, after calling on Pompey to defend the Republic, the entire Senate, more or less, fled to Greece. What's to be noted about this move is that Pompey was still the governor of Spain. And so, the legions personally loyal to him and the Senate were in Spain. And Pompey had a lot of them there. He had so many, in fact, that he was able to lend a whole legion to Caesar. Remember that? These legions were now across the Mediterranean from Pompey. So naturally, Pompey started raising more legions in Greece. Caesar eventually did enter the city. He seized the treasury and was elected consul, just like he wanted all along. Caesar still had to fight the civil war because even though he made himself consul, he was still hated by the rest of the Senate. Caesar decided to head to Spain first. He decided to take out the army without a general, then to turn and take out the general without an army. It might seem reasonable for Caesar to have immediately flown over to Greece to take out Pompey and get back the rest of the Senate, but in this case, the Spanish legions might have crossed into Italy, or at the very least, gotten rid of his support base in Gaul. Caesar did march over to Spain right away, and fought a battle in the northeast. It was hard fought, but ultimately it was Caesar's influence that won the battle, not a decisive military victory. And now it's about this time that I should explain Caesar's posture going into the Civil War. Caesar wanted to stay on the right side of the population. It was the only way for him to rehabilitate himself after marching into Italy. We talked about last time how Caesar was forced to cross the Rubicon and start the Civil War, so he had a cause to play himself as the victim. And so he did. He would play the victim card and use this to get as many allies as possible. And so, to accomplish this, instead of ordering executions of his enemies or even seizing and detaining them, he would instead pardon anyone who would go down without a fight. This is a brilliant move, and is probably the only reason why he was at all successful at this point. Since normally in ancient battles, if you are held up in a city, or you're on the opposite end of the political spectrum of the guy who at the head of an army, you have to fight to the death. Because maybe your allies will come and save you, or maybe some amazing event will leave that commander dead on the field. You don't know. But the point is, the moment that you got captured by them, you were dead. The moment that your army started losing, you would be killed by your soldiers. So you had to stay till the end. There was nothing else you could do. Maybe you could flee and join up with someone else, but you just have to fight till the bitter end there. And it's not like everyone was a heartless villain. It's just business. If you don't kill the major supporters of your enemies, they will be rallying points for rebellions. So you have to take them out and you have to show that no one else can come up against you. Normally, if you are as lenient as Caesar is and you let people go, then more people will be willing to go up against you because they know there's not going to be any recourse. But in Caesar's case, he had a simple system. If it was your first time fighting against him, you're free to go. 
If it's your second time fighting against him, you are not. And that was his M.O. He would pardon anyone who would surrender. Which means that any senator who backed the Pompeians but wanted to get back into the Senate was able to simply surrender and join up with Caesar. What this did was it created a lot of new allies, or at least people who didn't care either way, but were originally simply scared of Caesar marching on Rome and killing them. It made all these people come back to Rome, made his bid for power more legitimate, and made him seem like the good person. Another thing was that by allowing senators and other men who joined the Pompeian side to surrender and either join up with him or just kind of leave, it means that Caesar would have to fight less battles. It means that the troops that they had under their control would come over to his control. The money that they had would come over to him. He would be spending much less resources since he had to fight far fewer battles. This posture has already created lots of goodwill during his march into Rome, and has probably contributed to all the success he's had thus far, and contributed directly to his victory in Spain. See, the victory in Spain, like I mentioned before, was not a military victory. It was mass defections that led to the victory. Caesar then spun around and took his armies to Greece. It was challenging to cross the Adriatic Sea from the heel of Italy, but Caesar ran the blockade that was, by the way, run by his consular colleague from 59 BC, Bibulus. Caesar wasn't able to get all his men across, and he had to leave a bunch of men behind in Italy, Spain, and Gaul, and so he was greatly outnumbered in Greece, because by this point, Pompey and the rest of the Senate were able to create a large army. So, for the campaigning season, Caesar was fighting on the back foot. He lost his first engagement to Pompey, but managed to flee and then win decisively in Pharsalus. It was a stunning victory, and we can attribute the victory to the fact that the senators forced Pompey into it. They forced him to charge because they thought it was a foregone conclusion, and they ended up losing because Caesar had the advantage. Most of the senators fled. Pompey fled. But some stayed and surrendered to Caesar because they knew of his posture so far, which was great because he got so many more prominent men and senators to his cause, including... Marcus Junius Brutus. Maybe you've heard of him. Pompey decided to head to Egypt. Pompey wanted to keep up the fight, and Egypt was at this point a client state kind of to Rome. So it wasn't under the jurisdiction or power of the Roman government. Egypt was also quite rich, and so it could provide the needed power base to start a resistance. However, Egypt was currently in a civil war, between the two sovereign siblings slash spouses, Ptolemy and Cleopatra, who you may have also heard of. We can't get into the detail of the sibling-spouse deal, maybe I'll talk about it another time. Ptolemy, who currently held the capital of Alexandria, decided that he should take sides with Caesar to create support for his bid to power. Ptolemy wanted sole control over Egypt, and so he wanted the backing of the Romans, and so he wanted to pick the winning Roman, which was obviously Caesar. And so he did something dumb. The moment Pompey landed on the Egyptian shores, he was captured and killed. You can't understate how much of a mistake this was, because the moment that Caesar landed on the shores, he was out for blood. Caesar desperately wanted to pardon Pompey. Pompey was a former consul. He was a friend and an ally. He had been a massive figure recently in Roman history. And Pompey wasn't even a personal enemy of Caesar. There were lots of men who personally hated Caesar, but Pompey and Caesar had been willing to work together in the past. There was never a massive personal divide between the two, and in an alternate world, they could have worked together going forward. And most importantly, Caesar wanted that the massively influential Pompey was in debt to him. That would secure Caesar as the top Roman, when for the past several decades it had been Pompey. And so, Caesar arrived in Egypt and was pissed. Royally pissed. Most of you already know what's about to happen with Caesar and Cleopatra. We'll get to that in a second. Caesar set up his small army inside the capital, in the palace neighborhood of the city. He decided to use this opportunity to force the Egyptians to pay a massive amount of money. This money was owed to the Romans decades ago, 
and so it was a withstanding debt, and Caesar wanted to collect now because he needed the money, and he was kind of upset. And in my mind, I think he just wanted the pretext for war with them. Ptolemy and his court decided to fight back, and soon enough, they got the city into a riot. Caesar was nearly killed alongside the rest of his army. At this point, Caesar was effectively sieged within the city of Alexandria. It probably would have ended terribly for Caesar had not Cleopatra got herself snuck into the palace by hiding in a laundry bag, maybe. Her support as a sovereign and Caesar allowing himself to seem more legitimate by supporting Cleopatra was probably the reason why he survived long enough for the armies to come bail him out. I know it's not super important to the story, but I want to talk about Cleopatra for a second. I know that everyone knows who she is, and I want to say that it's rather unfortunate that one of the two or three most famous women in history is constantly painted as some evil foreign seductress. I have to admit, however, this is not unexpected. From Roman historical tradition all the way up to modern times, the only ways in which women were remembered to history, uh, in, at least in the Roman world, were either as model citizens and mothers, mostly playing up the mother side, or as the evil stepmother. And since Cleopatra wasn't Roman, and didn't eventually side with Augustus, she couldn't be painted as the model citizen slash mother. So, by default, she had to be the evil stepmother. This is extremely unfortunate, and I want to mention that because she's someone that everyone knows, and I think everyone should kind of know the truth about it. And so here's the truth. Cleopatra is never described contemporarily as particularly attractive. That's not her main quality. She became the mistress of Caesar and later Mark Antony, not because she seduced them and was some evil foreign queen. No, no, no. It was because she was, by all accounts, extremely interesting and a world-class conversationalist. She knew, like, six languages and took an active role in government and was really good at it. She was, by any metric, an amazing person to talk to. And off the top of my head, I can only think of, like, three other women that are comparable to her in this case, and even one of them, Livia, who you may have heard of, is always painted as the evil stepmother as well. I would like to tackle the important women of Rome at a later date, because it's a neat topic, because they're never talked about directly in the sources. We always have to get adjacent information, usually they're the wives or mothers of emperors, and we have to go based on the biography of the emperors we get. It's an interesting uh, problem to approach, how to understand them. Anyways, I'll talk about that later. Back to her regularly scheduled programming. Caesar and Cleopatra hit it off. And Caesar decided to back her claim to the throne in exchange for aid. And once the Caesarian army bailed them out, Caesar left Egypt in control of Cleopatra and effectively in control of Egypt. And he left her pregnant with his only son. The son, his name is Caesarion which means Little Caesar, I only bring up because I like his name. Caesar then quickly went to Asia Minor, modern Turkey, to mop up a revolt. The campaign was completed so fast that in his letter to the Senate about the achievement, he simply included his most famous phrase, Veni, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. And isn't that just the essence of Julius Caesar? In any event, Caesar then raced to North Africa, he stamped out the last, or so he thought, piece of Pompeian resistance. A couple senators raised an army there, and Caesar had to go fight them for control of the Republic. He won, of course. <laughs> Caesar returned to Italy, and aside from briefly stamping out the last pieces of resistance in Spain, the civil wars were done. An interesting thing about the Spanish campaign was that a certain Octavian, future Emperor Augustus, accompanied his uncle Caesar on the expedition. Augustus, obviously, is our eighth and final Republic Ender. Caesar returned to Rome as the master of the entire Mediterranean. Truly, this feat had never been accomplished before in world history, and that's an interesting thing to think about. Sulla was dictator for life only a couple decades ago, yes, but he was not the ruler of the entire Mediterranean. Since then, the Far East had been introduced to the Empire by Pompey, Caesar added Gaul, kind of, and had appointed the Egyptian monarch. Her career relied on him, meaning that 
just about every inch of sand on the Mediterranean coast was under Caesar's control. And by my account, that's the first time it had ever happened in world history. And this would be the case until the early 5th century AD. The entire Mediterranean would be under Roman control, and it all started with our man Caesar. Our man Caesar planned for 444 BC to go out on another campaign against Rome's enemies so he could have a true massive victory because I guess everything else hadn't been enough yet. He wanted to march around the Black Sea, maybe, and fight the Parthians who had defeated Crassus. In 46 BC, his victory over everyone was decisive. He wasn't yet dictator for life, that would come soon, but he had sole control over the city and the republic. Every senator had either been appointed by him, been his ally, or had been spared by him. Which means that he had everyone in his pocket, and he could do whatever he wanted. Caesar was always a man of the people, and we've known this since his consulship. He brought his reformist agenda, his sort of Gracchi-esque agenda, to center stage. Immediately after getting to Rome, the main thing he did was celebrate four triumphal processions. Which, for those of you who are taking score, is one more than Pompey. Caesar completely restructured the authority of the governors to make them less corrupt. He ordered many construction projects. He spent a lot of time fighting corruption in other parts of the Republic and fighting debts and bailing out poor citizens. He remade the Roman calendar to more accurately reflect the reality. This calendar, if it had not been tweaked ever so slightly by Pope Gregory in the 16th century, would be exactly what we use today. Everything about it is the same as we use now. See if this rings any bells. 12 months, some with 30 or 31 days. February, the second month, has 28, and every fourth year is a leap year to make up for the fact that the years is actually 365 and a quarter days. This was all Caesar and his astronomer. And of course, the month of July is named after him. Caesar reimagined the Roman Empire in his image, and genuinely, you could do so much worse when it comes to an all powerful dictator. Caesar was eventually appointed dictator, famously, and eventually dictator for life. He even had a throne in the Senate that sat between the consuls. It was made of gold. It was on everyone's mind that maybe this guy was trying to become a monarch, and it was honestly spooking everyone of the possibility of it. He probably was, by the way. It's just that it's a very touchy subject in Rome, and so it's very difficult for him to come out and say it. A giant group of senators were getting particularly concerned about Caesar making himself a monarch. They centered themselves around a certain Marcus Junius Brutus. Brutus was maybe the son of Caesar, it's kind of unclear. But regardless of the genetics, Caesar treated him as a son. Brutus was extremely conflicted then in the decision since his ancient ancestor, supposedly, was the famous Lucius Junius Brutus, who founded the Republic in 509 BC. Ultimately, he decided to kill Caesar. He and several dozen senators decided that Caesar had to die before he killed the Republic. Like I mentioned before, Caesar is planning on leaving on campaign in late March 44 BC, and this campaign would take years. And so they wanted to kill him before he left, because if he left for years, came back after conquering every single enemy of the Romans, there would be no stopping him. And so they chose the middle of March, not long before he would leave, and the Ides of March was the chosen day. The conspirators chose to kill Caesar during a Senate meeting. But, since the Senate had burned down in the disaster that followed the death of Clodius, his supporters burned down the Senate house to use it to make a funeral pyre, which is crazy. In any event, the Senate was meeting in kind of just random places around the city, and for the Ides of March, they were meeting in the Theater of Pompey. And on the day, the senators approached Caesar and his throne, surrounded him, and stabbed him to death. At the moment of Caesar's death, Mark Antony, the co-consul and 7th Republic Ender, was sitting just outside the room. Octavian, who was soon to be adopted by Caesar posthumously, was preparing for Caesar's campaign. He was out in Illyricum, uh, the modern Balkans. Marcus Lepidus, Caesar's chief administrator, was sitting just outside Rome with the legion. Finally, the assassins of Caesar were right on top of his body, immediately thinking that they'd be hailed as liberators. The Senate was, of course, also in the room, 
and these are our five main players for the next couple years. Immediately, Antony knew that Caesar's death could be used for the better of his career. Classic Antony. He drove up a frenzied rage among the population and scared off the assassins. The assassins fled, they ended up splitting up, but mostly they ended up in Greece. Octavian eventually returned to Rome, accepted the posthumous adoption and inheritance, and became a new Caesar, because as part of the adoption, Caesar gave Octavian his name. So Octavian got to now walk around calling himself Gaius Julius Caesar. Now that's a way to get Caesar's allies to like you. Well, the next couple of years are far too complicated for me to get into, and not just because I don't have a great grasp on them. If I could be completely honest, this five-way civil war is extremely interesting and exciting and would make an amazing TV series because it's almost comical. The allies and enemies that are made and then the backstabbing and all these different things going on. It's really exciting and really neat, but I can't get into it right now. I'll just get into the results. The Senate lost. All of the power in the Roman Republic fell into three men, the three lieutenants of Caesar, Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus. The three of them would beat the assassins in a pitched battle in Greece. So after a couple of years, all that was left were the three of them. They would rule Rome as a trio, in what we call the Second Triumvirate. But what's different about the Second Triumvirate versus the First Triumvirate is that the Second Triumvirate was legally binding. The first triumvirate was just a group of guys who made plans. The second triumvirate was an appointment. They were each co-dictators in a way. They were each given a third of the Republic, and it was their third, and whatever any of them said was law. Octavian in the West, Antony in the East, and Lepidus in North Africa. But keep in mind that none of these three guys are great friends. At one point or another, they were all enemies of each other, in different combinations for several years. It just so happens that they were the last three left, and all three of them needed to group up to suppress the Senate, so they could each personally have power over a portion of the Republic. And just like the first triumvirate, having three men in charge was enough to make sure that not one of them could take too much power since mutually assured destruction. All three of them knew that once you fight a battle for the Republic, it's going to take so many resources, the one guy who doesn't have to fight is going to become so much more powerful than everyone else. And so, it really sucked when it came down to just two. This happened because the son of Pompey, Sextus Pompey, managed to take control over Sicily and a couple other islands in the Mediterranean. He almost dislodged Octavian entirely. Octavian and Lepidus managed to retake control of the island, but as a result, the legions under Lepidus defected to Octavian, and Lepidus was evicted from the triumvirate. Now, Octavian has full control over the west, and Antony has full control over the east. But, while Octavian managed to consolidate his power over the entire west, Anthony was consolidating his power in the east. And at this time as well, as you may know, he started a relationship with the endlessly infectious Cleopatra. This relationship was ultimately politically motivated, since as a master of the east, Antony essentially used Alexandria as his capital and used Egypt's funding for his endeavors. He needed Egypt's support. Octavian would eventually use Antony's connection to the East and to Cleopatra as a pretext for war, arguing that Antony abandoned his people in favor of the foreigners in Egypt. This all sounds like it happened super fast, but the decisive victory that Octavian had over Antony and Actium happened a full 13 years after Caesar's death. It was in 31 BC. There are so many things that happen in these years, it's also convoluted. I, I can't get into it right now. I would like to return to it at another time, but ultimately it isn't that important. The main takeaway is that the son of Caesar followed Caesar's legacy, and now 13 years had passed, 13 years of civil wars. And what also passed was that Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus, after taking control, decided to bring back the prescriptions, which Caesar ignored. And they were pretty terrible. So many prominent Romans, rich Romans, senators, people who opposed the Second Triumvirate were killed. And so it came to a point that, much like when Caesar had full control, when Octavian had full control, 
He had not only appointed every single senator, had every senator as his ally, he had killed off anyone who opposed him. It wasn't a senate that was filled with allies, appointees, and people he pardoned. It was simply allies and appointees. And after 13 years of civil war, no one wanted to kill Augustus because then it would start another civil war. The Republic was too far gone. So when did the empire truly start? Historians date it to 27 BC. This was the year in which Augustus solidified his power and made himself capable of fully ruling without the need of the consulship. He made deals with the Senate that meant that Augustus had every relevant office at once. He had all the relevant powers and titles to do whatever he wanted. The powers that Augustus held included, but were not limited to, the power to veto legislation, the governorship of all relevant provinces, the control of the majority of the legions, and eventually Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest of Rome, just like Caesar before him. And so this is why we say that Augustus has become an emperor here. It was full control. Even Caesar didn't have this kind of power. He was still a Senate-appointed dictator. Augustus simply was beyond the law. There was no position of emperor. He simply just held every position. But even at this point, Augustus still could not pretend to be a king. If he went too far in that way, doesn't matter how many civil wars or how much people didn't want to kill him, if he said, I'm a king now, he would die. People still remembered the days of the Republic. And so, Augustus presented himself as the first citizen, the princeps. The whole aim of Augustus's model, the Principit, was to convince everyone that the Republic was going strong, that nothing had changed. Unfortunately, something had changed, and it had changed for good. Augustus would reign for 41 years. This was so long that the emperorship was able to solidify, and he was able to pass the imperial title onto Tiberius, and for the emperors to reign until the death of Rome. The Senate would never return, not even for a day. And that's it. The Republic is dead. Augustus's simultaneous roles and having nearly every relevant political office resulted in him becoming the first emperor. It has been 482 years. 482 years. That is how long the Republic existed. I want to talk about the idea of the Republic killer that I focused on in my telling of the end of the Roman Republic. I talked about eight specific men, and I've touched on just how many more men can be included in this list. Among them, Scipio Africanus, Cinna, Clodius, Crassus, Lepidus. This goes to show the shortcomings in my approach. I don't regret or disagree with the decision I've made to present the history of the Republic in this way, but I want you all to appreciate the ways in which I simplified the story. It's natural that whenever we present such a complicated story, we have to take shortcuts. And that doesn't mean that the way in which we've told it is bad. It just means that we need to understand that there's a bigger picture. I've taken a limited view of the Republic, and so I want to expand on it a little bit more now. The death of the Republic is probably the single most important thing to understand in the history of Rome when trying to understand the motivation for political moves, even by 96 AD. So let's not. For me, I appreciate Roman history in the period of the Empire because I've been exposed to Roman history a lot. And so whenever I hear of a new political move, a new battle, a new emperor, a new appointment, it makes sense in my mind because I've been connected with the Romans so much that I understand why Domitian will exile the philosophers in 93 AD. At first glance, saying Domitian exiled the philosophers in 93 AD, that means that he's paranoid. Well, the Romans were really superstitious. There's probably a number of reasons why Domitian wouldn't want people messing with religion in his city then. Maybe there was a prophecy, who knows. But in my mind, this indicates that there's any number of reasonable reasons for him to have done that. And so that's why I spent so much time on this background information. It's important to understand the Romans so we can understand things like Domitian exiling the philosophers in 93. Let's now delve straight into the meat of the issue. Why did the Republic die? And why did it die now at the hands of Caesar and Augustus? 
The end of the Roman Republic is quite complicated, and there isn't a single explanation for why it failed, and I'm going to present to you a sort of unified theory that I have, but know that it is, like the rest of what I've done here, limited in scope, and it's simply a tool for kind of understanding it. And this unified theory that I have, that is my personal take on the end of the Republic, boils down to a simple thesis. The Republic's power and its institutions simply diminished with time. Now let me motivate this by explaining the before and after of the Republic, comparing the times of Scipio Africanus and even before the Punic Wars and the time of Caesar. In the early years of the Republic, even up to the time of Scipio, it would not have been possible for a disgruntled general to march on Rome in the same vein of Marius, Sulla, and Caesar. Simply, the inertia of the Republic kept all ideas of monarchy at bay. For those of you who've taken high school physics, you'll remember that inertia says that objects in motion tend to stay in motion. So what I mean by this when comparing it to the Roman Republic is that the institution and rules of the Republic are so entrenched and standardized that attempts to take advantage of the Republic would be easily squashed. The rules of the Republic, from its army conscription to its consular elections, were designed to eliminate the chance of civil war and monarchy. Simply put, when the vast majority of people were promoting Republican ideals, no man could get enough support for a violent coup. One thing that careful listeners would have realized was that I omitted the full statement of Newton's Law of Inertia, and that is that objects in motion tend to stay in motion, and objects in rest tend to stay at rest, unless an external force is applied on them. The other parts of the statement also play a role in my mind. I imagine the Republic as a massive object flying through space, able to knock any rocks and dust out of the way without much difficulty. These rocks are generals trying to get extraordinary commands, young men trying to get appointed to the Senate before they're allowed to, things like that. Things that would decrease the prestige of the Republic. But even though this massive object of the Senate, the massive thing that it is, is able to brush these off, those little rocks and pebbles brush up against it. After enough people ask for an exemption, there would eventually be someone who gets one because there's eventually a Scipio Africanus in the Punic War, and they have to do it. And so, each little rock gets easily shoved out of the way, but, but each one applies a little bit of force to the Republic, eventually slowing it down. And then eventually it stops, and then it's easy for anyone to push it around. I know this analogy is kind of going a bit far, it might be more confusing than helpful, but I really like it a lot. One year, you might have an election dispute that is settled by an overwhelming majority opinion. But then the next year, that precedent is used to make an illegal appointment. In the analogy, the first rock slowed down the Republic, which made the second rock able to really slow it down a lot more. So we have an abstract sense that the Republic died because it stopped being good at being a Republic. This seems obvious, but laying out the ground rules now makes it easier to delve deeper. To find out why the Republic's prestige diminished so much, and to find out why it died when it did, Let's think about what was different about Rome before the Punic Wars and the time of Caesar. The first thing to change was that Rome started being in a relative constant danger. Constant war with the Carthaginians and others led the Republic to be low on qualified magistrates. Since the previous generations of politicians were all dead on the battlefields fighting Hannibal. This allowed the exemptions of young aristocrats like Scipio Africanus to get governorships that they shouldn't have because they were unqualified and too young. The prominent Romans that benefited from these found themselves able to govern Rome's brand new lucrative provinces. The result of the Punic Wars and other events of the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, Rome had rapidly expanded and many new provinces were introduced to the empire. Governors were appointed to provinces where they were able to suck the region dry and line their pockets and the pockets of their supporters back home. The result of this was that certain men became extremely rich and influential due to provinces, due to extraordinary commands, due to military victories in the wars, what have you. The point is, the power in Rome was being centered in individuals. In addition, powerful men were able to create power bases outside of the city of Rome. Formerly, every single important person and important decision would go through the Senate. But now, the empire is so big, and so diverse, and so rich, 
that individual governors could amass a massive base of support in the provinces, like Pompey did in Spain and in Greece, and Caesar in Gaul. This ultimately diminished the central authority of the Senate, and increased the personal authority of a handful of Romans, because now you had governors like Caesar in Gaul, who were able to create lots of support in Gaul, create large armies in Gaul, and then march on Rome. In the past, would not have been possible. In the past, Caesar wouldn't have been able to raise so many legions. He wouldn't have been able to find people who met the requirements. And he had such a massive province, he had so many supporters there. He had a massive population. It wouldn't have been possible when there weren't those kinds of provinces. The provinces also exasperated another problem, the class struggles. I've done my best to maintain a focus on class struggles in this podcast, since I've come to the conclusion that they're extremely important, especially in the Roman Republic. In my first year of university, I took a course on the early history of the Western world. The professor of this particular course was absolutely obsessed with class conflicts. He had written books about the topic and brought every idea in Western history back to class conflicts. It was like the thesis statement of the course. To me, it almost became comical that class conflicts was always like a punchline to whatever joke that is the rest of the material. The course ingrained the idea of class conflicts being important into my mind, but honestly, I kind of just ignored it. But once I spent a lot of time thinking about the Romans and the Roman Republic and our modern world, I realized how important it was. The Roman Republic, more than most historical institutions, was absolutely defined by class conflicts. Pretty much the first thing I discussed in episode 2 was the secession of the plebs. Ep episode 3 focused nearly exclusively on the topic of class struggles as well. What I'm trying to convey is that more than anything, it was the social agitation that led to the end of the Republic. The growing power of rich individual senators, compounded with Roman farmers being banished to the cities in favor of foreign slaves, led to a complete social revolution spearheaded by the Gracchi and their successors. What was the final result of this division was the complete division in the ruling class as well, between the conservatives and the reformists, those who did and didn't support the poor masses. This also contributed to the endless political violence in the streets of Rome. This violence never ceased between the days of Tiberius Gracchus and Augustus. Roman politics became personal dangerous and aggressive. Now let's take stock of where we're at. The extreme situations in Rome led to individual Romans being more individually powerful through military victories, extraordinary commands, provincial governorships, etc. The new provinces, combined with economic disaster for their lower classes, led to a further divide of the classes entirely, and ultimately a divide within the Senate. The extreme careers of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus showed the flaws in the Republic, and how not even consular power was needed to be extremely influential. Gaius Marius consolidated so much power into his individual person that he was able to hold consecutive consulships. He acted as like a de facto dictator. Additionally, Marius was able to, very importantly, reorganize the military. And among other things, the fact that there were no requirements for service made legions personally loyal to their commanders instead of the state, paving the way for civil wars, because without this part of the equation, the division in the Senate would be just like the time of Tiberius Gracchus. Old men arguing in the Senate with them occasionally killing each other. Once we got legions involved being personally loyal to those men, that's when the civil wars start, and that's when the dictatorships start. And so the result was a back and forth, with Sola and Marius taking Rome and purging and counter-purging. The social war and the civil wars of Marius and Sulla led the Republic to be in more danger, leading to more exemptions, leading to more rich senators, leading to a larger income inequality and separation in the Senate. And by the time of the first triumvirate, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus were simply the men who benefited from this political landscape the most. They were the ones who took advantage of it, and they were the ones who played it correctly. Crassus became the richest man in Rome, Pompey became the most celebrated person in general, and then Caesar would become both of those. Three men vying for power meant that each individual couldn't take sole control. I talked about this before, it's just that two of them may fight it out, 
but then the third one can mop up the winner every time, so no one plays for full control. But once Crassus was out of the way, it became a straight-up duel between Caesar and Pompey. The civil wars that resulted plunged Rome further into the bin, allowing for the accession of Caesar as dictator, eventually the legally binding second triumvirate, and then finally the full powers of the singular Augustus. That's the end of the Republic. That'll be all for this episode. In one week, I'll be back with the Julio-Claudian dynasty of emperors. I'll see you then. Thank you.